our roots as organizers and what does that mean? Um, because we need critical mass in order to make change, you know. Um, critical mass meaning thousands of people. Um, and what does it take to, to, to move people um, to come together as a critical mass on issues? Um, I know that this is a very uncomfortable issue for Minnesotans, especially white Minnesotans, but we gotta talk about it. We have to be honest about our racism because it interferes with critical mass. And we need everybody involved in this movement. I really wasn't gonna take it to this level, but you know, spinning off of what Nate's saying, what Michael's saying, and the numbers of people that are needed, um, one of the things that I talk about is our history as humanity is concerned. Um, you know, we all know the history of genocide. If any of us you know, have been paying attention to our history, I mean the real history of the United States, you understand that genocide was committed against Native Americans, just like they did in Canada, and you know um, we're all trying to heal from that mass genocide, ethnocide, ethnic cleansing, um, just like you know other people. But one of the things that I think white people um, forget is their roots and where they come from, and who they are, and what their history has been. Okay. Because, you know, if we think about Papel, and think about the 7.5 million Europeans that they slaughtered in Europe based on forced religious doctrination. And that means the stripping away of our identity as human beings. When I talk about our identity as human beings, I'm talking about our connection to the earth, our ceremonies, our drums, our fire ceremonies, our water ceremonies, and what does that mean? Because the Celtic and the Druids, they had, you know, the pagans, they had their honoring ceremonies for the water and the earth and the sky and the moon and all of the things that are natural to us as human beings. And what, you know, and I don't mean to step on anybody's Christian toes, but fuck it. I have to because it's like that in, that indoctrination dehumanized us as human beings. It in, you know it made us insensitive to who we are as natural human beings when we have an intuition within each and every one of us to say um, we are human beings, we are humanity, and you know let the fear go because that whole it, Christian doctrine was fear-based, it was shoved down people's throats, they slaughtered and committed genocide, and continued to commit genocide after that in other countries. So it started in Europe, and then it moved to you know, the United States, it moved to Africa, it moved to South America. You know, it basically proliferated the world, this Christian doctrine. And, and, or, and, and, and these are like indigenous cultures that all worship the sun, that all worship the earth, they had respect, they had dignity, they had honor, you know, and that's kind of what, you know, my message is here today, we cannot forget our roots and where we come from. Fortunately, you know, as Native Americans, our history doesn't go back as far as the European slaughter is concerned. It's pretty recent compared to Papel's period. But what I'm trying to say to you is that we were able to retain our language. We were able to retain our culture. We still have our traditions. We still have our connection. We still have our teachings. We still have our medicine lodges. We still have our drums. We still have our connection to who we are as natural human beings to the earth and to our environment and to the universe. Many of the non-Indian people out there don't know who they are. They don't know where they come from. I'm not saying everybody, but the majority of them, if you, if you ask a person directly, do you know who you are? Do you know where you come from? They're gonna say no. No, you know, I, I'm from America. Like, no, you're not. <laughs> I'm from America. My, G, my DNA comes from America. It goes back thousands of years. Your DNA came from someplace else. Do you know who you are? And a lot of people say, well, you know, I was Ger I'm was, i German, I'm Irish, I'm English, I'm this. And I say, well, pick one and go with it and find out who you are. <laughs> because you really need to touch, that, touch the heart of who you are as a human being. 
because that is our connection and our commitment to who we are as humanity. If we have forgotten who we are as human beings, we really need to rethink what is our purpose. If there's something lacking out there and we don't feel fulfilled as human beings, there's a reason for that. Where is your ceremonies? Where is your drums? Where are your songs? Where is your honor for the water? You know, we really have to begin to look at this at a more global level as far as genocide and ethnocide is concerned because it's happened to all of us. So the racism bullshit needs to end. It really does. Because nobody is more superior than anybody here. We've all had our turn at genocide. We've all had our turn at getting stripped away of who we are as natural human beings. So in order to do that, you know, we have to give up that false idea that we're superior. We're not fucking superior. Who ever told us that we're more superior than anybody else? And how can we buy into that doctrine? It's a racist doctrine based on genocide. On your own genocide. On our genocide. It's, all, it's happened to all of us. We're all in this together. One big happy family of recovering from genocide. You know, And we all need to be honest about that. And if you don't know about it, you need to learn about it. You know, I'm on Facebook, ask me. I've written about it. I talk about it. I don't have a problem talking about it because I had to find out who I am as a human being and really began to search my identity as an Anishinaabe woman. Because that too was taken away from me. We're living on the reservation when we had Catholic churches there and people were converted over and we almost lost our language, our ceremonies, everything. And all, you know, it was slipping away from us. And you know, because you know, we, we are who we are, we were able to retain that. And now what's going on in Canada happened here. Just so that you all know, when you hear about the Dawes Act, you all know who the, what the Dawes Act is? Can I see a raise your hand about what the Dawes Act is? Okay. In the late 1800s, the Dawes Act, after the Jackson Removal Order and after the 1854 treaty with the Ojibwe, was concerned where they made permanent reservation lands. The General Allotment Act, the Nelson Allotment Act, was enacted for reservation lands to break up the land in individual parcels per tribal member. And that's where enrollment came in. In order to have a parcel of land, you had to be enrolled. Enrollment meant pedigree. You know, Native Americans and animals are the only thing that the United States government has registered as far as pedigree is concerned. You know, I mean, so think about that for a minute. You know, but in order to sell your parcel of land, based on the fact that we're starving, our ancestors, you know, they're starving, they didn't, didn't fulfill their part of the treaty, so they don't have no goods, they don't have no food, they can't take care of their families, they can't take care of their children. They end up forcibly, basically, uh, forcing them to sell their parcel of land, their allotment of land. You see this happening up in White Earth. You happen, it happened really, really uh, a lot here. In Minnesota, it happened in Wisconsin, but not as bad as it did in White Earth. You know, you hear about Winona LaDuke and her White Earth Land Recovery Project. That has everything to do with allotment and what happened. And what happened up in Canada is they introduced that policy last year, or a year and a half ago, a, an allotment policy. And they illegally, up in Canada, passed those policies overnight against the, the chiefs of the territories up there uh, approval. They, were had, they gave them 30 days to respond to the, to the proposals and to the policies, and they didn't respond in time, and so they passed those, those abrogation treaties overnight, which opened up the waterways up in Canada to corporations, and, they're, you know, and breaking up those lands into parcels of land and selling them individually. So here we go again with this repeated history up in Canada, which has happened here. So we see these similarities of, um, of genocide and ethnocide, and of course the corporations are like salivating, you know, um, going and approaching individual tribal members to see if they can store nuclear storage waste on their lands up in Canada, um, opening up the waterways for more tar sands, opening up their waterways for uh, for uh, mining, uh, and you name it, you know, they're trying to use it. And Harper, to me, I don't even know, I don't even know how to describe it. Besides just a puppet for corporations, just like Obama, you know. But 
One of the things that I was talking to Michael about last night, and I think that we really need to be aware of what's going on here, is that there is a global attack on the earth. It's not anything like, oh, these corporations are just like, no. It's deliberate and it's intentional and they have every institution in, you know, in collusion with them. The, the NSA, the CIA, the FBI, the military. If people think that we're at war because of some made up terrorist, you know, wake the fuck up. That's not what's going on here. I pulled up the CIA's natural resources page. Don't ask me why I did it. <laughs> But I just had to, like, what the hell's going on here, you know? I just happened to fall into it the other day. And I pulled up the CIA, I'm like, what is going on here? Really? You know, I'm always asking what's going on, and you should see my post. I'm like a mad woman, I swear to God, on Facebook. I don't even know if people follow me. Jesus Christ, man. I post so much shit every day, all day, you know? And I try to get every base covered. You know what I mean? So if you're not going to pick it up on Idle No More Minnesota, you're definitely going to pick it up on Native, uh, Native American uh, Rights and Resources. I mean, you know, the list goes on and on. But one of the things that I did was I pulled up the CIA page. And it had natural resources. And it had all of the countries listed of every resource they have. Natural resource. Now, what the hell is the Central Intelligence Agency doing monitoring all of the natural resources throughout the world? They have a listing of A to Z of every country throughout the world and every single natural resource available to them. Now, interestingly enough, a couple years ago, General Betrayas, no, Betrayas, <laughs> anyway, anyway, he was interviewed, okay? Um, I can't remember who was interviewing, so, you know, and you know, some of the, you know, we're blessed sometimes because they get so arrogant and stupid, they just kind of leak out information because they're so full of themselves, you know what I mean? It's just like, it's a blessing to us when they go there because they reveal all of these truths. And one of those days, it happened. And he revealed to this reporter, you know, why are we in Afghanistan besides poppies? <laughs> You know, you know, besides poppies and monitoring it and the military monitoring all the poppy fields and we have the highest rate in heroin, of heroin use in this country since the 60s. I wonder why we're in you know, Afghanistan. But besides all that, what General Petraeus said is he said, they have trillions. I mean trillions. This is a direct quote. They have trillions. I mean trillions with an S of dollars worth of natural resources there, and we are trying to find the new Silk Road to get those resources out of Afghanistan. So if you wonder why we're at war, think about the natural resources around the world. That's the bottom line. They can conjure up any bullshit terrorists they want. The real issue here is that they want the natural resources. And so when we talk about global solutions, I'm thinking about uh, Mother's Day coming up in May. And I think it's enough time. This is my solution, Mike. <laughs> I know I gotta get off the mic here. How many minutes do I have? Am I already over time? Okay. I think that as far as the solutions, and I talked about critical mass, and what does that mean? I don't know if y'all were around back in the day when we used to have the Mother's Day march down Franklin Avenue to Powderhorn, and there was thousands of women that were marching down Franklin Avenue for the Mother's Day March, I think we need to really bring that back and have a message in that march about our water. Because in my tradition, in my culture, the women are the speakers for the water and the land and the children in the future. We speak for those things. We are the, you know, we are the future generation's caretakers. We are the caretakers of the land. It's the women's responsibility to speak on the behalf of the water. And I think we really need to think about Mother's Day March again and come together as women and fuck the racism. You know, we need to start inviting everybody because we need everybody. We need everybody right now, whether you're, you know, red, yellow, black, white. We, this is about humanity and saving humanity. My solution is to have the Mother's Day March come back again. We can march down Franklin again. 
we can invite legislators there, we can say no to polymet and say, you know, you know that six hundred and sixty eight billion dollars or a million dollars that the state legislature passed to build a fucking stadium? Why didn't you invest that in jobs? You know? Why didn't you take that six hundred and sixty eight million dollars that you were gonna use for a for one person, you know, to uh, ascertain profit off a, a couple of games of football every year, really? That's your priority, you know? No, what your priority should be is your taxpayers who pay for your job. And I think that move to amend, I think we need to come up with our own, you know, amendment to the state legislature and make an amendment to the Minnesota state constitution to say we are, like California did. California fined the Koch brothers a million dollars for um, donating $16 million to one of the legislators out there. It's illegal for them to do that based on their, their uh, California state constitution. And I think that we really need to start thinking at that level. We need to change our own state constitution to say we are not going to accept any big money here as far as legislators are concerned. And do our own move to amend the, to the Minnesota state constitution. So anyway, those are my two solutions on a global level. I think that we can really make some change at, at the polymet level by holding these legislators accountable. You know, and we have to out them. And outing them, what does that mean? That means going to their office with signs and saying, do not accept bribery money. We need to call it what it is. It's corruption and it's bribery and they need to stop. Because that's why, you know, you know, these are not campaign contributions. It's called bribery. You know, quit putting all these sugar-coated bullshit words out there. You know, we need to call it out for what it is, and I think we all need to start doing that. And, you know, I want to thank you all for listening to me. I hope that I was of some help. You know, I don't know more, you know. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Pat. An, Indian, an angry Indian woman or an angry black man talking about race makes me really nervous. <laughs> I had to say that. And using the F-bomb too, that's... So you guys, um, at this session, we're, we have very consciously and deliberately as a part of this process, and just to let you guys know, we made a deliberate policy of making sure to break up the speakers we consciously made sure that we had um, persons of color be a big part of this, our, of the speaking and of the organizing, and I'm very proud of that. Also, we made a very conscious decision to actively make space for public discussion and conversation. So at this point, we're gonna take a very quick break from the speakers, and we wanna hear from you guys. Stand in line. Get on up here, Missy. Vikings Town is a perfect example of that. Carol? Or Blanche? I'd just like to point out that we have a donation bucket back here, and the more that goes in here, the better we all eat next time we meet. Oh, here it is. There's my money pitch woman right there. Yeah, one of the things that I was thinking about as, if, as Nate and Sandy were talking uh, is that there's a combination of three things going on at the same time. One is with, where's your truth? Okay, where is the truth in the religion? Where's the truth in the ethics? Where's the truth in the politics? Where's the truth in the advertising? What jobs? You, sure, we can give you jobs. I can give you a job right now working, sweeping up uranium dust. Do you want that? Do you want that because it's, I, I'll pay you $25 an hour to sweep up uranium dust. Will I cover your medical expenses afterwards? Hell no! Okay, so polymet, same thing. We'll give you great jobs right now digging dirt and, and creating a mess, but we're not going to cover your medical expenses. We're not going to cover anything afterwards. And that's one of the big things I think that we can use to, to reflect 
back on people. The other is critical mass. What is critical mass? Most major changes and revolutions have happened with less than 15% active population. How many wars are fought with how many percent population? Two to three percent of the population fight wars. War's a bad thing, but it makes change. So if we've got enough people that are willing to go sit in intersections, it takes three to four people to block an intersection at any given time, and it only takes a couple seconds to do it, and then you get up and you walk away, they can't even arrest you, because they can't get there fast enough. And you walk down another block and you block an intersection, all of a sudden you created a havoc over there. So all these little things can happen with very small critical mass. It can be three people can be critical mass. And the other thing is that, uh, like what people were saying about positive and negative um, attitude. Well, I've got, a, I've got a great positive attitude. If you're going to continue to destroy and kill the earth, I'm going to positively run one right to <laughs> the <next> side. <laughs> that's all. That's it. You know, we can say it with a smile on our face. You know, it's time for you to go to jail. We got good home cooking at our jail. <laughs> that's my two cents worth. Thanks. <laughs> talk about um, something that Nathan put out that I thought was really, really good, uh, which is to really call out these groups. Um, I, our organization, Public Communities United Against Police Brutality, we've had an identical experience to what you had with Take Action. Uh, we worked our asses off on the Huang uh, Lee case, and they basically slid in, took the credit for what we did, and um, basically used it as a way to try to get people to come to their annual meetings and give them money. And this is what um, I want to really say about that is, I think a lot of times if you follow the money, that's what the real key is here. You know, these people, um, organizations that get grants from General Mills, you know, from some of these other, you know, high-powered, um, you know, uh, foundations and things like that should be looked at with high levels of suspiciousness. Um, you know, I think that the way that these, um, these sort of uh, corporate structures or these kinds of um, establishment structures actually seek to control the movement is through um, application of money. And so, you know, as much as we can ourselves keep ourselves untainted from that stuff, that's what we should endeavor to do. So like our organization, we've been around for almost 14 years now, we've never had a paid staff. And we don't intend to have a paid staff, we intend to remain grassroots because we do not want to be bought off by these characters that um, come in and do all that crap that they do to control what you do. See, because if they're trying to tell us how to do our work, we are not going to be able to be down there shutting off the city council meeting like we do, um, going in there to Crystal and shutting down their uh, city council meetings because they got a whole mess of corruption going on there. You know, all the kind of stuff that we do that's real, real, real active, we won't be able to do those things anymore because you're right. Um, you really pointed out how these groups will tamp down that stuff because it pisses off their funders. So follow the money, you guys. Honestly, that's a big piece of it. And like I said, you know, the, and and call out these organizations that do that type of crap, and don't allow them to do it. Um, tell you legions of stories, but I think that that's a very key message that you said. So thank you for that message. I know you're not shy. No, Dave's got his hand. Uh, Dave has his hand up. I want. Go ahead. I, mean, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, you made a distinction between Canadian and uh, British single payer. Yes. Now, I never knew there was a, a great distinction. Could you tell us about this distinction? Sure. Um, the Canadian single payer system um, is good. The difference between the Canadian system is that it is in, in, in Britain, it's the actual government itself is actually in charge of the entire healthcare system. The government itself hires the doctors, they hire the nurses, they build the hospitals. Whereas the Canadian system is more of a, an entity is separated from the government. 
but not, but not, and, and has influence with the government, but it's not actually part of the actual government. So in, in Britain, it's actually the government itself is actually in charge of buying, of renting other doctors and the nurses and building the hospitals. Whereas here it's more of a, kind of a private government cooperation thing, single parent. Mm -hmm. And the British system's much better. Mm -hmm. And as an Irishman, I'll say that. Okay. Yeah, I, I think, you know, as we talk about this today, I think we're united on a whole lot of these issues. I think it's excellent that there's a lot of different distinct groups that work in their own way and work with their own issues because a person, you know, and a group can only be experts in, in a certain area and stuff. But I think we need to really be thinking, and I hope this is the theme throughout the day, of how we work together as allies and coalitions, maybe not, not a, a united group, but at least people and organizations working in coalition that draw a real distinct line between resistance to the society that we have right now versus trying to work within it and persuade them to do a better job. Because they're not going to respond simply to our good ideas and our education. You know, the speak truth to power, I always think speak truth to everybody else. The, the power knows the truth, you know. And, and, you know, so we really need to to do that, and I think so. so I, that's some other thought. That's what we, we really should be thinking about today, and drawing that line. Um, one of the things and ways in which they control us is every good source of uh, organization of control controls both sides of each issue, yeah. and that's what we're seeing, and that's where they want to make sure. They have both sides. Of course, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, though that charade is beginning to fall apart. But there's, there's a, well, I think the same people control both sides of that. It's real clear. But they control these other things, as, as Nathan was talking about. And, you know, we have to draw that line. And one of the ways, for instance, is like the jobs issue. Jobs, jobs, jobs. Well, the people who are controlling that, who are talking about that, who put that out as the big division among us, are the people who, they don't give a goddamn about jobs, jobs, jobs. They care about profits, profits, profits. That's why jobs building the Viking Stadium or jobs building Polymet is all about jobs. But in education, it's never about jobs, jobs, jobs. You know, um, we need to see those kinds of propaganda as ways that split us up and, and, and really expose that country. Oh, hi. I just want to acknowledge I really like what I'm hearing, uh, which is to warn us, it's, you know, kind of like the board, you will be assimilated. <laughs> so, you know, I, I we can come up with this really good work, you know, how about like a $15 an hour minimum wage, how about this and that, and single care and health care, and um, all these good ideas, I think we really have to be conscious and aware if something starts to get traction, <laughs> the powers that be that will come in and try to assimilate us. They're, they'll take all the credit and leave us something that is so useless and pathetic, yeah. you know, like 9.50 an hour, and they will jump up and down and pat themselves on the back. <laughs> Hi, we've done something really useless, you know, and I think, I, I like that we're really aware of that and we're really speaking about that. And then he's going to ship all the jobs off to, up to the TPP. So I'm with Nate. I'm going to speak at 12:45. I feel the responsibility to tell you you better stretch. Okay, this is like a lifeguard telling you don't eat before you go swim. And Patricia mentioned the CIA. When you hear CIA, you you hear Central Intelligence Agency. What you should think is commit illegal atrocities. See you at 12.45. Buckle on. <laughs> I just wanted, Last one, and then we'll give the next okay. I just wanted to reinforce your point about the British system, which is true socialized medicine, yes. vastly superior to single payer. However, corporations so much control what is going on in this country, we can't even get single payer. And the only reason Great Britain got socialized medicine in 1945 the American right wing's hero, Winston Churchill, was voted out of office in June of 1945. Clement Attlee and the Labor Party were put in, and they immediately 
instituted the National Health Service. And to, under today's circumstances where corporations control the English Parliament as much as they control the American Congress, you couldn't even get single payer through in England today. Are you the doctor? Are you Dr. Mayor? The chance? No. Okay. No. <laughs> no, but I I do have a PhD in European history. Okay. <laughs> everybody with a PhD, raise your hand. Just, no, serious. No. Everybody with you know, that's it. I got an associate degree in nursing. <laughs> All right, guys, so let's, let's move on. Um, thank you. Um, when we talk about, about people in groups who, who have been marginalized and, uh, and discriminated against and facing um, oppression and suppression, one of those people you can always talk about is the Palestinians and the way our government assists in their oppressors. Um, and, and by the way, many Palestinians are not even allowed the right to speak at events. They're shut down, they're marginalized, they're protested for daring to speak the truth. And many, many of the same truths that Patricia was talking about. Um, is with a great deal of pride. I'd like to um, announce we're going to have uh, Sabri Wajwa speaking on Palestine and U.S. foreign policy. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Hello, everybody. Everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. It's not usual that I need a microphone because I've always been told my voice is very loud. Um, I'd like to speak about the Palestinian issue. Many of you probably already know me. I'm a member of the Anti-War Committee, um, which does a lot of work for Palestine. And uh, anyways, uh, the thing that me and Mike have in common is... Uh, we get sick and tired, we go to anti-war protests, and it's just like uh, most of the people, they think it's just about uh, bashing Republicans. I mean, let's get one thing straight. Democrats are just as guilty as the Republicans in what's going on right now around the world. If you're not willing to speak out for what's right there in front of your eyes, for justice, after you hear the sources for yourself and investigate and dig deep, then you're no different than back in the days when it took hundreds of years for white people in this country to finally wake up and say enough with the slavery or enough with the genocide versus the African Americans or Native Americans. So I'm going to go ahead and speak to you about how it connects the issue with Palestine Israel. I'm going to go ahead and bring up sources and you could check every single source that I give you for yourself so you don't just take my view as a Palestinian as being biased. First of all, with the occupation, I don't want to go ahead and talk about occupation and bring up the word Palestinians. Because I find eight out of every ten Americans that I've met keep thinking that once you hear Palestinian, it automatically means Muslims. People, for some reason, don't understand that Muslim is a religion, Islam is a religion, but Palestinians are people. There are millions of Palestinians Christians. So please try to understand that Instead of Palestinians, I want to bring up Muslims and Christians that those terms also, so people try to understand. So when I say Christians, that's people that share some of your faiths. That's people that have the same exact beliefs you have. So at least try to think and connect that this would be happening to you if you lived over there right now. First of all, right now, apartheid. It is apartheid what's going on in Israel right now. You can't cut it any other way. Nelson Mandela, may he rest in peace, which I'm pretty sure everybody here already knows a lot about Nelson Mandela. And he said, our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinian people. And this guy's an educated person. He spent 27 years in the prime of his life just sitting in solitary confinement because he spoke out and he wanted to go ahead and want the freedom for his people in South Africa and apartheid. So he didn't just say this just to make Palestinian people feel good. He said, that, he said this because, of course, he knows what's going on over there. Ex-President Carter wrote a book called Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid. Now, this is the ex, this, is, this, this guy used to be the United States president. And look at the words he chose, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid. And it's a very good detailed book. This is not only a man who used to be president. This is a man who used to be president, visits uh, worldwide, all over, speaking about in peace conferences went to Israel many times and seen for himself the apartheid injustice done by the Israeli government. 
So, apartheid. Like, why am I saying apartheid? Well, I'll give you examples. Citizenships for Jews, and then separate citizenships for Muslims, Christians, or others. My wife was born in Jerusalem, lived there her whole life. Her family goes back hundreds of years, generation. Yet because she married me, an American citizen, once they found out, she immediately lost her citizenship. But if you're Jewish, you automatically could marry whoever you want. You could have dual citizenships. In fact, uh, uh, a person of Jewish religion in Russia that has never ever stepped foot in Israel is offered $10,000 to go live in Israel when they're doing everything they can to strip the citizenships from the Palestinians so they could kick them out. Passports. A uh, person of Jewish descent has 10 years to leave Israel before he comes back and renews it. He or she comes back and renews it. A Palestinian has one year. If you're one day past that one year, the only way you get your citizenship back is you have to stay there for at least three years, pay thousands of dollars of money, and I'm talking about like 30, 40,000, with a really good lawyer, one of the lawyers that is not a Zionist. You have to get a really good lawyer from inside of Israel that's not a Zionist, that feels for what's going on to the Muslims and Christians over there, and he will get it back. But that's the only way you get it back. Separate roads. The roads are paved, nice roads for Jews only, and dirt roads, separate roads for Muslims and Christians, Palestinians. IDs. You automatically have a separate ID if you're Jewish, and you have a separate ID if you're Muslim, Christian, Palestinian. I told you about the passport, citizenship, ID, separate roads. Checkpoints. When you hear the word checkpoint, I'm not talking about a checkpoint like you're stopping, there's really soldier, grab your ID, okay, go on your way. No, these checkpoints are made to humiliate you. These checkpoints are made to brutal, I mean, you, you, you hear the stories about the corrupt police officers here. Well, almost half the Israeli soldiers have a very tricky finger. They don't have no handguns on the side of them. They're holding four foot machine guns around their neck. I'm an American citizen. When I was there last in 1998, every single time I got stopped at the checkpoint, he would ask me 50 times over and over, where are you from? I'm from Minnesota, from the United States. And the same question. They're taught that. They're taught that very specifically to try to anger anybody they stop so they could want that person to get mad so they have a reason to beat him on his head with a machine gun or to go ahead and shoot him and say this guy was giving our soldiers a problem. I'd like to go over to uh, the issue right now with, I told you about the 10,000. Uh, if you're a Jew, if you're a Jewish person from Iran, you're offered $25,000 to go live in Israel. So now, let me, let me go ahead and like bring how it connects. There's thousands of rabbis, that's the holiest you could get when it comes to Judaism, that protest every single year denouncing Zionism. So let me go ahead and try to explain there's a difference between Judaism and Zionism. Judaism is a religion, and it speaks in their own book. Rabbi Weiss, look him up on YouTube, he's a rabbi tells it over and over, goes around the world protesting against Zionism and what the Israeli government is doing injusticely to the Palestinian Muslims and Christians. He's a rabbi. This is not my words. Go to YouTube and look him up. And he says over and over, before 1948, Muslims and Christians and Jews were living together in the Holy Land without any problems until the idea of Zionism, it's an ideology, it's not a religion, that went ahead and took it over. And you hear the term over and over, well, why can't Palestinians go live in Saudi Arabia or go live in Egypt or go live in Jordan? I'm Palestinian. You hear about different myths about, oh, well, Saudi Arabia, it's only for Muslims. I'm Muslim. I can't go to Saudi Arabia right now and get a citizenship. I can't. Even if I was born there, if you're not full Saudi Arabia, they will not give you a citizenship. That's all we're asking to happen in Israel. Me, personally, I, wasn't, I was born here in the U.S. I lived it all my life. I don't want a citizenship there. But I want to know that if something happened to me, my wife could at least go back to her homeland so she could go ahead and live with her family without having to struggle, without having to go ahead and pay thousands of dollars for a lawyer just to get what's fair. Everything equal. The first intifada didn't start till 89. You keep hearing about suicide bombers? Suicide bombings did not happen till the first intifada. What happened during those first four decades of the humiliation, the checkpoints, 
the shooting people. You know right now there's over 5,000 Israeli soldiers in jail because they, 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 they decide they're not going to continue uh, being uh, occupiers in the occupied areas. Over 5,000 Israeli soldiers. Benjamin Netanyahu, the president of Israel himself, his nephew was jailed because he was one of those. They call him refuseniks. He said, I refuse. I refuse to go ahead and be a soldier in the occupied territories. My government tells me to shoot at unarmed women and children. It tells us to scare the hell out of them in checkpoints. It tells us to hold their young men and brutally just embarrass them in these checkpoints so we can put the fear of God into them. This is Netanyahu, who's the president's own nephew. I mean, you have to understand, this is connected because every single time we're talking about money, well, you can't talk about money without talk, talking about the number one aid of recipient of money. The U.S. sends, they say 3.5, but they say it's really closer to 5 billion every single year and turns a blind eye to Israel to what it's doing. You have to understand it's all connected. There's no difference between the U.S. and the West. The West is not uh, pro-Islamic. The West and France just uh, banned, I think it was year uh, two years ago, whereas Muslim women can't even wear hijab. So why would 82% why would of Europeans go ahead and vote that the reasons going on between the Israelis and the Palestinians is the conflict? They go ahead and voted, that 82% of the Europeans voted that they see the conflict is started by Israel. Because in Europe, in China, in Russia, in Africa, you guys don't understand. You don't get the news that they get out of the U.S. There is so much control in this country from APAC, the powerful Israeli lobby, that it's just mind-boggling. Ex-CIA ex top official Philip Gerard and Ray McGovern, these used to be CIA officials, said, and I quote, the Israeli lobby has so much, this was just a few months ago, the Israeli lobby has so much power right now in the U.S., they are very soon to have complete control to deciding every single seat in the House of the, of the United States of America. These are people who used to be CIA top officials just a few months ago. Kenneth O'Keefe, former Marine, he actually lived in Gaza for like six months last year. This is a U.S. Marine. He didn't hide his U.S. Marine. You see him on YouTube talking about it. He lived in Gaza. They didn't shoot him, they didn't kill him. They walked him up with open arms. He's seen for himself. He gave up his U.S. passport. He's seen what the U.S. is about about Iraq, going into Iraq for oil. And then every time the U.S. does something in justice, it's okay, they can just apologize, nothing's going on. Everything just goes smooth sailing when the U.S. does it. They want to forget the history. They want African Americans to forget everything that was done to them. Every time they show you a commercial in the army, they put a, a Latino, Native American, a, a, a African American, because they want them to forget. They want them to forget. But just like, what's your name again? Patricia. You know, because she's Native American, and I feel a lot with what they're going through, because it's like, they lived here. You know what I mean? It's like, they didn't get asked for the pilgrims of Europe to come and just terrorize their people. Okay, the Palestinian people, what happened to the Jews in the, in the Holocaust, let's get one thing straight. It's very sad and tragic what happened to them. But get one thing straight. The Nazis did that to the, to the Jewish people. It's unfair, and these are thousands of rabbis themselves that speak out. Let's get one thing straight. Those people of Europe, when you guys did what you did to the Jews, don't give me that that Hitler was uh, atheist. Hitler has in his book over 300 passages referring to his love of Christ and of Christianity. But I don't in any way blame Christian people for what that nut did and, and, and had his millions of followers. Of course not. It's the same way as one of Palestinians. Those suicide bombers that do what they do, it's like 0.00001% of, of, of the Palestinian people. How many Palestinians have to keep suffering because we keep hearing about, oh, it's because of this, because of that. For 40 years, there was no suicide bombers, yet Israel still kept doing their apartheid tactics. And I want to finish it really quick with speak. Malcolm X. When he spoke, he said, you can't separate freedom from peace. Because people can never have peace until they have their freedom. Palestinians have to have their freedom first before they have peace. Paul Finley, Republican, 22 years. As soon as he started to speak out and he finally woke up and seen what Israel's doing, he wrote a book called They Dare to Speak Out. 
and it spoke about anybody. He said, anybody tries to say one word against Israel, they will be condemned. He's a Republican. What happened after 22 years? APAC immediately put money in, in, his, in the candidate running against him, and they immediately took him out of office. And I want to finish with documentaries. Again, don't believe one word I'm saying. Go look at the sources I'm going to give you. There's a documentary that came out. It was nominated for Best Documentary, two of them. One is called Five Broken Cameras, made by a Palestinian and an Israeli. You see for yourself, this is footage, camera. You see every single thing. You see things like an Israeli shoot soldier shooting a Palestinian man tied behind his back, just standing there waiting to be arrested, right in his knee for the fun of it, laughing, because he didn't know the camera's on. And you'll see other things that will deplore you. Uh, Peopleinthealive.com, produced and directed by a Jewish man who simply takes a group of American runners, goes over there, they want to do an event where they just run throughout Israel and the West Bank, and see for yourself how the Israeli soldiers treat them. And then last, I want to end it with the gatekeepers. The five most top officials that, are, that were in charge for the last 30 years for the Israeli Mossad, all speak about, in this documentary, gatekeepers, about the injustice that they finally came to admit that their government did, while they themselves were the ones who gave the orders. The last five over the last 30 years. Don't believe any word I'm saying, I'm giving you the sources to see for yourself. And then, I want to ask you just one, I want to finish it with a question. If it's, if it's just a myth that occupation and the suffering that the Israeli government is doing to the Muslims and Christians and the Palestinian people, if it's just a myth, the occupation, the humiliation, and what the Israeli soldiers are doing, shooting unarmed women and children, if all that doesn't really produce the suicide bombers, then I finish with a question. If anybody could answer me this through discussion, I will applaud you. 99.999% of every suicide bomber came from the occupied territories. The Palestinians don't just live in occupied territories. There's over 2 million Palestinians that live inside of Israel that are not occupied. 99.9% .9 of the suicide bombers, though, come from the occupied territories. And they're just as religious inside the unoccupied territories. If somebody could answer me that during the discussion, then I will go ahead and agree that the occupation is not causing the suicide bombers. Thank you. Nothing like a little bit of truth, huh? So um, at this point, we actually have uh, unless it, David, Dr. David Mayer, and Laura Le Lehman, if you're here right now, which I don't think you are. I have a, I have a question for the last speaker. Can we take a couple questions? Um, are you guys up for it? Sure. sure. I'm up for it. Go for it. nation um, and what it wants for its nation. But, um, however, I don't always necessarily agree with the tactics, but um, you mentioned Nelson Mandela. Um, uh, in the Mandela movie, they talk about um, how that uh, how the ANC cannot go into collaboration with the Pan-African Conference because they wanted to push four million Afrikaners out into the sea like like the, like some like some people in the Palestinian struggle want to push uh, the Jewish out of the sea. Um, I mean, do you think uh, it's because um, there have been a couple leaders um, that are in the Palestinian struggle that have ex have exploited people's emotions towards um, towards uh, towards Israel, like in the, in the same like uh, like black nationalism stoked people up against white supremacy. Um, but black nationalism necessarily is not black liberation. Um, and so, what are, what are some reasons why, why, in your opinion, why the world community um, has not jumped on board and we haven't fought? And I know the Zionist propaganda is it, it, it's real. It's, it's very real. It, it permeates every, every place in the world. But, um, it, you know, it's, it, it's the reason why Africa I mean, and, and other, I don't want to speculate, but it's the reason why other places aren't as united as they should be. Um, but what, in your opinion, if, if, uh, if, if Palestinian liberation organizations were much more 
if they if they use different ta if they use non-violent tactics, um, and they had much more of a class analysis, uh, the leaders of Hamas and everything. And and not saying that they that they can't adopt an armed struggle. Do you think they would be more successful getting the world community to support their efforts? Um, and can you speak to that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. As I mentioned when I spoke, um, first of all, a lot of people don't know this, but Israel actually created Hamas. A lot of people get surprised. They created them so they could go against... Uh, a lot of people get surprised when I tell them this, uh, but uh, Israel actually created Hamas. They created Hamas so they could go ahead and go into a civil war against uh, uh, Arafat back then and his party. And, and then when Hamas uh, finally took form of themselves, they went ahead and uh, took their own way. First, let me just say, uh, those who know me, like Dave knows me really well, me, I'm a pacifist. So I'm not in any way, don't, in shape or form, ever condone violence. Okay, I'm a firm believer of uh, 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 pacifism, non-violence. My point about the suicide bombers that started happening is when I seen from my own eyes, and again, I don't condone it, when I see my own eyes, I see what could cause some of these people to become that way. Uh, an example, after September 11, seven months later in April of 2002, uh, towns like Janine, Nablus, and all these other towns where Israel just went in and used, they had the green light from the U.S. Right now we're thinking about, everything's about September 11, September 11. They got a green light to do what they want, and people aren't really going to be bringing up or hearing about what's going on in Israel. They pulled those towns, they pulled those communities. I mean, they literally just destroyed. They not only killed hundreds of lives, passing lives, but when the UN immediately said, we want to come in because we're hearing stories of you using Palestinians as human shields. Israeli soldiers will grab a Palestinian 10-year-old. They will tie him to their, what do they call it, Hummers. They tie a Palestinian kid to the windshield of their Hummers to make sure no Palestinian would try to shoot at them if they're coming into the towns to bulldoze the town. When the UN wanted to come in, they, they rejected it. Every single member of NATO said, hey, you have to agree to this. They rejected it. It just takes one member of NATO to veto it. The US always vetoes it. Since 1971, Europe keeps saying, let us construct a 50-member team of international observers to live in Israel, Palestine, and let them send the information to the rest of the world so we could, they could document once and for all every single thing they see. Since 1971, Palestinians say, yes, please, we want that. And Israel keeps voting no. And, just be, and because it only takes one member, the U.S. keeps vetoing. So when they do it, nobody could put pressure on Israel. So ask yourself, if an FBI agent suddenly comes to your house and says, your neighbor said that you're hiding bodies, you're killing people, and you're burying them in your backyard. I want to check your backyard. If you, for, and, and we're going to take care of it, pay all the expenses, and return it the way it was. What other reason, other than you're hiding bodies in your backyard, do you not tell the FBI, go ahead and check the backyard? Why wouldn't Israel let the UN go in and check Nablus and Jean everything for the, till now, till now, they don't know where the Palestinian people that were killed and missing, where they went. So as far as when, when, when Hamas finally got voted in 2006, they only got voted because the Palestinian people got sick and tired of Araf, Arafat taking the money that's being sent to his party, embezzling it in his pockets, and they got finally sick of it. So it's not like they supported by voting for Hamas, they supported for Hamas to go ahead and, because Hamas is a party. It's not like every single member of Hamas is a suicide bomb. It's like people voted for the Democrat party, but they voted for them to do a certain thing, and now they're seeing the Democratic party ain't doing what they want them to do. So this is the question I always tell people, like, with what's going on right now. Challenges the big because there's a lot of there's a lot of black people that are critical of President Obama. You know what I'm saying? And 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 there's a lot of people that are critical of him in a negative sense. Um, but uh, more and more as that's starting to come out, and we're not trying to be revisionists. We're just critical. You know, drones. Libya, there's a lot of people in the Pan African community that disagree with President Obama and his and what he did in Libya. But for some reason, the Democratic Party is not the mechanism to to, to create that dialogue. What, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that Arafat, who, who in Hamas, who's the leftist people in Hamas that are saying, look, we need to change tactics, 
and we need to get the world community involved. Um, and we could have an armed struggle, but I don't know if sabotage is. What, what I'm saying is that where's the class, where's the political ideology that's leftist leaning? And and because so, Arafat, in many respects, a lot of Arafat doesn't. Arafat's not Nelson Mandela. He's not Che. He doesn't. His politics is not where it needs to be. That's my point. Is that we're the people that that are grown up organically with the correct politics that would help help people understand. Very good. Uh, you asked a great question. Yeah. Right now, the the opposing group, uh, Fat. They get support from Israel because behind the scenes, under the table, they will stand and allow Israel to do what they're doing so they look good. But then they just speak out in front of the public so they can look good in front of the Palestinian people. The Palestinian people got sick and tired of that. Just so you know, the majority of the Palestinian people, they don't care if the country is called Israel all over. Until Arafat came, a lot of people don't know this, but when Arafat and his party came, Palestinians were able to move around freely as they want. Most Palestinians can't stand Arafat. I can't stand Arafat. This is just a guy who wanted to come, be in party, have money in his pockets. That's all it is. Until Before Arafat came, Palestinians could go, come please. My sister who lives in the Khalid in Hebron could go to the Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem and pray. When Arafat came in, she can't do it anymore. If you live in the West Bank and Gaza now, you can't leave. So if you live in, in Gaza, which is an open air prison right now, you can't leave Gaza. It's like all of a sudden Canada coming into Minnesota and Canadians immediately go ahead and set their own rules and foundations and says, if you live in Minneapolis, which Gaja is like 10 times smaller, let's just say if you live in just this district, you could never leave this district. Oh, but that's not it. We'll allow a few of you to go out and work, but when you come back, you could bring certain food. They weigh their food when they come back in Gaza. Not weapons, not checking or anything, their food because they want to terrorize them. And you said, where are the people? I just finished telling you. Over 2 million Palestinians live in the unoccupied territories. No suicide bombers come from the Palestinians that live in the unoccupied territories when they go to work. My dad used to work with many fellow Jewish friends of his. They, he was the type, he was one of those guys that would build hotels. And he told me stories of peace and friendship and everything. Again, I don't condone any suicide bomber, just like I don't condone Israeli settlers. A lot of these Israeli settlers, to me, when an Israeli settler takes a stone and throws it at an eight-year-old child in front of an Israeli soldier, an Israeli soldier says nothing, again, don't take my word for it. I'm like Michael Moore. I'll back up my sources. Go to YouTube. Just put Israeli crimes versus Palestinians. See for yourself the hundreds of videos on camera. It's not no special editing. It's not no special effects. Ain't Steven Spielberg edited this thing. And see for yourself how Israeli soldiers stand behind while Israeli settlers are stoning Palestinians. You keep hearing about Palestinians throwing rocks. Israeli settlers on a daily basis throw stones on little seven, eight-year-old Palestinian girls walk into the schools. Uh, you got them, if they shoot somebody, if a Palestinian does something of violence, he's automatically, his whole home is terrorized. Even if it's not his home. If he lives there, his home, owned by his grandfather, whatever, the whole home destruction, destructed. But if a person of Jewish descent does something like kills a Palestinian, or does something violent, he's crazy, mentally ill, he goes in the hospital. All we're asking is for the same, the same law. That's all we're asking. Okay, give this man a mic and watch out, folks. <laughs> You're the man. Thank you. So we're getting close to lunch, folks. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm very grateful that one of our other speakers just showed up. So Sam, you're, you're off the hot spot for now. Um, but I would very proudly would like to introduce... You know, we have to recognize what lateral oppression means. 
You know, when, we, when, when they were so oppressed, when all the genocide happened to them, when the Holocaust happened to them, you would think that they would come out of that having some compassion and empathy and understanding, but yet they didn't. They ended up committing some of the same actions against the Palestinians that were done to them. So we have to really look at lateral oppression and what does that mean to us as human beings. Like the Irish and the busing issues uh, in the 70s, the Irish were horribly racist in Boston. And I'll, I'll gladly stand up to that. Anyway, um, very proudly. Um, Oh, uh, we got one more speaker. So we'll speak now. We're going to do now. I think it'd be better if I do it right now. Okay, Angela, you got two. You'll be on the mic. Ah, uh, yeah. I'd... Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. I just wanted to say a couple of things before everybody rushes for the table at the end of the next speaker. Um, hi, I'm Dave Bicking, um, and um, just want to point out a few things again. The bathrooms right straight through there, and to your right. Um, um, also, we have coat racks in the um, entryway there, and as more people come in, and especially during lunch and after lunch, it makes it a whole lot easier for people to get in and out if you hang up your coats out there, and probably more comfortable for you too. So, um, hopefully, we're keeping it warm enough in here for you. Um, and recycling, um, since lunch is coming up, this uh, we try to keep this building as close to zero waste as we can, which means we're recycling all cans, bottles, plastic. Um, and particularly food waste for compost. So we have a stainless steel thing for compost. All food waste goes in there along with napkins, paper plates. Well, we don't have paper plates. Ah, let's see, there you go. Um, because we have a dishwasher. So, and it's a machine, not a person. Um, and so that's where that, that stuff goes. We're going to try to do that. But for now, you can put your dirty dishes in the pan that's over there, and that'll be taken in and, and washed. Um, so you don't all have to go running into the kitchen. Yeah, question on that? Ah, oh, donations, yes, very good, very good. They go partly towards this group, partly towards your lunch, and partly towards the cost of keeping this building going. So, yes, um, yes, please, donations back there in the bucket, um, and uh, we'd appreciate it. It takes some money for the food, of course, and of course, keep the heat on and, and keep this building working for all the groups that are here. Which brings me to the next point. Um, this is this building is my little contribution towards a cooperative, uh, uh, radical movement that's out there. To we, we need our yeah. we, we need our own infrastructure, one that we can control, and the one that uh, where we have the freedom to do as we wish, and they can't be undercut so easily. They'll tell me about the city inspectors, but nevertheless. Um, this is, this is part of that infrastructure, and I want it to be that way, and I'm open to suggestions and ideas for people about how it can work better for a, a cooperative movement that's all working for the same thing against the same enemy. Um, right now, um, this building is home to Women Against Military Madness in the big office over there. Behind me is an office for the Welfare Rights Committee and the Anti-War Committee. Yay. And uh, in the basement, we have Communities United Against Police Brutality. MIRAC, the Immigrant Rights Action Committee, and until a few days ago, a Minnesota Normal. Um, one of the things I just wanted to announce is we do have an office opening, so if you know people who would like to join this uh, cooperative home here and uh, have an office here, we have an office in the basement, 175 square feet, uh, 175 a month plus internet hookup, and um, so we're looking for a group that would fit in with those who are here, just a, this is really the first announcement of it. So let people know so we can uh, have folks who are compatible here. And in addition to that, we have a second apartment. I live upstairs. And we have a second apartment upstairs, which is the tenants just moved out of also. And while I'm still open to the possibility of being a residential landlord, I don't like that that much, though it makes more money. Um, I'm thinking of having that as another office in the bedroom, about 150 square feet, a pretty nice setup up there and the, uh, their old living room being a place for a second meeting space for like cozier meetings. Maybe put up some couches and nice chairs and stuff like that and have a, a cozier spot than this for, for smaller meetings. So that's also something I'd like you to spread the word if uh, there's somebody who needs that, either as a residential space or as I say, more likely for an office and meeting space. So and that would be a cooperative meeting space as well. So just, just those quick pitches, um, yeah.
I'm totally with the program here and I uh, love it. Thank you. Dave Bickey is the man. So, uh, Boo, just before I have Angela get up to speak, um, Bucket is going to be passed. It's going to be passed more than once. Um, if you cannot afford, then please do not give. Do not, do not break yourself. If you can't afford, pay for the guy who can't afford to do this. They can't put money in. We're going to have sandwiches. We're going to have pizza. We're also going to have a full dinner afterwards. So don't be afraid to dig heavy. Okay? Thank you. Now, I'm going to pass this around right now. Very proud. A wonderful young lady. Um, and I'm hoping I'm pronouncing your name right. Bushner or Buchner? Buchner. Angel Buchner from the Welfare Rights Committee. And you're going to be speaking on the, her coming campaign with the Welfare Rights. around our flyer real quick for our opening day rally, which is the legislative session on February 25th. Hope to see everybody out there, so I'm just going to pass it down. Okay, like Dave said, um, the Welfare Rights Committee meets here um, every other Saturday. We have meetings. Um, and our office is located over there, but we meet in this area. Um, so anybody's welcome to come. We meet 11 to 1. Um, our organization's been around for 20 plus years, so we're not just a fly-by organization. <laughs> We've been around for a long, long time. Um, our members consist of former and current welfare recipients um, and low-income working poor people, so. um, mainly women. And uh, we don't discriminate against men. Men can come too, but it's mostly it's mostly women and um, women of color. So um, I'm gonna just kind of talk about uh, a little bit what welfare rights does, you know, and then get into our current campaign. Um, so like I said, our organization um, we organize from the low income communities. We go to the welfare offices in Minneapolis and in St. Paul. And um, we organize our community and to come in to um, help us fight to save the social safety net, what's left of it after the Democrats and the Republicans tear it apart. And <laughs> we try to re revive it and uh, keep it intact for the low income people because we say that um, instead of putting a time limit on welfare, there should be a time limit on, on, po on, on, on poverty. Um, I'm going to talk about our current campaign, which is uh, raising the welfare grants. Um, the welfare grants have not been risen in over 28 years, so that's been since 1986. And in 1986, at that time, there was a 1% or 2% increase, and that was like a dollar or two. So in 1986, it was 437. Today, in 2014, it's still 437 for one mother and one child. To find a place to live for $437 and pay everything else, let me know, raise your hand so I can get to you and find out where that is at. Um, so that's our current campaign, and um, we're asking organizations to sign on to our call. If you would like to sign on to our call, you can go to, well, um, it's on the, our leaflet there is our website. You can go to our website and your organization or an individual can sign on the call to raise the welfare grants. Um, and we're asking organizations to endorse the rally for February 25th. Um, and so far we have had plenty of endorsements, but we still need more. Um, we would like for people to unite around this, uh, around this because it's an important issue. Um, so welfare is like actually the floor to which wages can't fall, right? So it's important. It's a working person's issue too. So if there wasn't welfare, then they could drive down the wages way lower than what they are, you know? So we also support the, um, um, the uh, minimum wage to be raised too. Because um, anybody knows that People that are on welfare are the last to be um, hired and the first to be fired. And once they lose their jobs, there's not an employment, unemployment insurance for them. Welfare is unemployment insurance. 
for the poor. So it's important that we sustain welfare for poor people and working people. And um, yeah, so let's uh, just kind of go over some of the stuff, um, what we were facing up against last year. Um, you would think having a democratic governor and having a most democratic legislator that people would support raising the welfare grants. And we had the toughest fight last year trying to get any of them to even move our bills. And what they did do, um, what we're kind of grateful for, but it, it's kind of like a win-lose situation, <laughs> um, they gave us a housing increase of $110 to put towards the welfare grant, but only if you don't live in subsidized housing or get Section 8. Um, and it doesn't start for two years, and that's 2015, when it should start right away. So um, that's one thing. And then the second thing is, is that we were successful at um, on doing the family cap. And the family cap is where if you have another baby and you're on welfare, you wouldn't get no money for that baby. Let's punish the baby for being born. So <laughs> um, that also was undone, but that doesn't start until 2015. Again, it's things that should happen now and not later. Um, so this year, our bill consists of, um, so we have three parts to our bill. Um, Section 1 moves up the implementation date of the housing allowance from October 2015 to July 2014. Section 2 moves up the implementation date of the repeal of the family cap from January 2015 to July 2014. And Section 3 says federal tenant funds must be used for a cash grant increase for families on MFEP, the first grant increase in 28 years. It states that general fund money must be used to use to replace the uh, proper, excuse me, properly redirected TANF funds. So they get, so TANF, which is Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, is a block grant that's given to the state of Minnesota. And then the state decides on how they want to fund that. Only 27% of that money goes to directly cash grants for families. The rest of that is gone to other things. So, <laughs> no. Um, well, that's what we're saying, that the money that, instead of taking TANF money, which is temporary assistance for needy families, we say take money from the general fund to pay for these other things, child care, um, the child tax credit. Um, so they're using the block grant to subsidize these other things. Yeah, child tax credit, um, work support, um, services for people on MFEP to go and sit in front of a computer for 8 to 12 hours a day and look for work. Um, things that we already do anyways. So they're using that money for that. And then they, um, the big thing last year that lobbyists were doing against us was terrifying the legislators by telling them, don't support this bill because this bill will end emergency assistance for families. Not true. Um, emergency assistance um, uh, is a whole nother pot, and counties can decide on whether or not they want emergency assistance. Hennepin County and Ramsey County are the only two counties that do have emergency assistance, and other counties have opted out, and they're using that money for other things. And it's not going directly into the cash pockets of the poor. And we also say that Doubling the grants would help families stay out of poverty because A, it would sustain their ability to stay in one spot. They would be able to keep a phone on. And when you have a roof over your head, it's easier to get a job, right? So like if you're homeless, you're working, people are trying to get a hold of you, you can't because your phone ain't on, you never get a job. So it's an endless cycle, you know? Viciousness of poverty. And, um, and even doubling the grants still keeps us below poverty. And right now I also wanted to state that there's over 70,000 children in Minnesota that are in extreme poverty. So raising the grants is to help the children of Minnesota. Not just, not just people when, when people think about welfare, they think about lazy people, 
people not wanting to do anything, sitting around watching TV. It is a never-ending cycle to be on welfare. You have to jump through a lot of hoops just to get it. You have to go through a lot of programs. You have to be looking for work actively. You're, it's, not, it's not just, you know, you're not just sitting around, you know, collecting a little check. And I don't know anybody that wants to <sighs> sit around and collect 437 because it's a miserable, miserable life. So just putting that out there, too. It's just bad stigmas against poor people. It's more, more things that they put fear on to the politicians and, and uh, things like that. So I hope to see everybody come out February 25th, opening day. Yes, they're cutting everything. That's that. That's another thing. It's like every time people turn around, they're always cutting more from the less. Instead of cutting from the top, they're cutting from the bottom. And we're always the ones that are getting, you know, we're always the ones that are getting like chop, 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 more and more. The other thing I wanted to say is that, um, this is something that everybody should unite around. I mean, all groups should unite around everybody's cause. Because if you look at the causes, they all intertwine in some way or somehow. It's, 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 it's a way for, if we argue about little things within our own groups, it's a way for the enemy to divide and conquer us. So... I say, you know, I say that with, um, you know, with love because it's like we need to unite as a whole and not divide upon each other with little things. We're not always going to agree on everything. People probably don't agree with, with me, you know, doing what I do and, um, you know, supporting poor people's movement. But I agree with it, and I and I am going to keep fighting for it. And it's something that I want to do. And I don't want to because somebody has an issue with what my group does have an issue with me because I stand for everybody. So, you know, and and, the, and it's a saying, it's like, um, you know, the, the saying where they say uh, um, an injury to one is an injury to all. Those are not just words. It's not just a statement. That's a real statement. People should keep that in their mind when they say that statement. Don't just put it out there for a fancy word or a fancy statement. It's a real thing. So. I hope to see people out to opening day on February 25th, 12 noon at the state capitol in the front steps. Come yell with us, come chant with us, tell Governor Dayton to raise the grants. They haven't been risen in 28 years. He needs to support this, and so does the state legislator. Thank you for having me. Isn't she great? Yeah. Seriously. So when Angel talked about it, and this is kind of the whole point of what, what Angel just said in her presentation is exactly the point of what we're doing here. Solidarity is not a word. It's an action. If you know that I got your back, and you know that I got your back, then we can work together and trust together and have actual solidarity with more than just words, but with actions. Thank you very much, Angel. So um, we can actually talk for about maybe not do a little public discussion as the pizza is cooking. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe 10 minutes of discussion and then we'll get the pizzas out. And we'll, there's a feast back there, by the way, you guys. We're going to be feasting. You better be hungry.
that are very, very pro-Israel. So you've got a double whammy going here from the left and the right um, supporting Israel. And the military industrial complex. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. Tom Hartman, the radio commentator, he calls the uh, forces the banksters. You know, the banking people, they're like gangsters, the banksters. And they kind of cause this financial meltdown. And so, but they're not being penalized, really. They're not, nobody's going to jail. They're paying a few fines, but they're just a minuscule percentage of their assets. And so we really need to have a financial transaction tax. Um, which would like be point zero 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 something on each Wall Street because they were gambling. That's the problem with high CEO pay. They're just using that excess money to gamble on Wall Street. There's not many constraints to put on that. So to slow down that gambling, we need a financial transaction tax. And that should go first of all to the economic victims of this meltdown. So like the unemployed, look at the unemployed, 1.3 million people and their kids are another two million people and they're really suffering around our nation. You know, they're going to have to sell, uh, foreclose, they have their homes foreclosed down and, and um, so it's really, and so there's just not enough activism for those people. And uh, financial transaction tax is so much help there. Ralph Nader proposed that actually. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Holly Hodgson. Holly Hodgson too. Um, okay. Missy Hans. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Alan. <clears throat> Mr. Hancock, please. Alan Hancock. I spoke at the uh, Progressive Forum in Duluth. Just want to throw out another idea of a solution. And I agree with you on being a pacifist. And Patricia for the uh, Indian movement. I think just some wonderful speakers today. Some great ideas. But I recommend... Some other reading by Michael Eisenstein, uh, The Ascent of Humanity, and also a book that our book club is now, our Green Party book club is reading for this month called Sacred Economy, and how our whole lives throughout the uh, ascent of humanity from indigenous people a couple thousand years, years ago to the advent of creation of money, uh, that is just really corrupted our entire life and how we're all we just a, a slave to the money uh, issues and that's what a lot of the when we talk about natural resources and trying to get money out of the ground um, so I recommend reading those sources and as I was um, mentioning in Duluth I think another way of thinking of solutions is to not be working so hard on trying to fix a broken system. I think we need to be working more in a community atmosphere, trying to develop uh, a nurturing culture. And I'm so glad that uh, <coughs> Patricia and others have talked about the role of women and that they really need to be setting the model for how we govern our culture or change our culture. We need to get away from the macho uh, image of uh, only uh, the dominant are the, the leaders. We all, as, as Patricia brought out and Eisenstein brings out in his book, the, the humanity, who we are. And uh, I think we, there was a comment about Christianity. I think really a true Christian loves the earth just as much. And it's unfortunate we have these zealots and extreme groups to really spoil it for the else. So uh, just some idea of thinking of other alternatives and not trying to always fix the system, but try to have some alternatives and how we can work together to work outside the system. We can't rely on the government and the, and the uh, national government. We need to rely on our local economies and come out with some alternatives. Okay. Um, you guys, sorry, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, beg your forgiveness for this and ask your permission uh, for something. Robin Monaghan was supposed to be coming here to speak on behalf of the Move to Amend movement, and sadly he wasn't able to move it. But with your all's permission, I'd like to give the uh, microphone over to a member of the St. Paul Move to Amend chapter, 
and Amber Garland to talk about move to a man for five minutes. Is that okay? Is that okay? I thought you'd be okay with it. Hi, everybody. I'll just take real uh, quick. Uh, Robin Monahan and his brother Laird, they had never been politically active in their life. And when Citizens United were passed, they were so angry, they were so pissed off that they walked across the United States just to protest Citizens United. Robin likes to say he got to see the country at two miles an hour. And what Citizens United are doing right now, we're, it's in the Minnesota House of Representatives. It's House File 276. It says corporations are not people and money is not speech. And right now, in Move to Men, we're trying to get it passed this year. So we're calling people, we're calling the constituents of the representatives, and we're trying to ask them to write a letter to the representatives saying, I support House File 276, which says money is not speech and corporations are not people. How do you feel about House File 276? And because I've heard that when representatives, when they receive like, five letters, they consider that an avalanche. They consider that this is overwhelming. So we're trying to get people to write their representative to vote yes on House File 276 and then to let us know how their representatives feel like. I, I've been involved in so many different issues. I mean, you know, our food uh, is controlled by Monsanto. Our energy is controlled by fossil fuel corporations. Our health care is controlled by insurance corporations. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm getting really tired. But why don't we go to the roots? Let's go to the root of all this. Let's go right to the corporations. They're not people, and, the, and money is not speech. What we're trying to do is to get an amendment to the Constitution of the United States. I believe the magic number is 38. If 38 states pass this resolution, and so far, 16 have. Minnesota will be the 17th. It's passed in the Senate. Now we just need to get it passed in the House. Then, once 38 states do this, it gets kicked to the federal level. And if they vote on it, then it gets added to the Constitution. So the next time uh, a Citizens United comes up, between, comes up from the Supreme Court, it'll actually be in the Constitution. No, this is illegal. And thank you for your time. Oh. I, I'm not the moderator, but go ahead. Um, I just wanted to say, um, for if, if you'd like to, to join in helping out with it, um, uh, Ken Pentel of the Ecology Democracy yes. Network is, is launching the state capital on this, for this very same bill. Ken Pentel has been fabulous. Ken Pentel, he's been up at the House of Representatives. He's been talking to Republicans. He's been talking to Republicans about how money is not speech and corporations are not people. And he's getting some positive response. And it's funny, he says the Republicans always tell him, nobody ever comes to talk to us. But, you know, but, but Ken is, Ken Pentel is, he's talking to them. So that's great. Go ahead, Denise. Something, uh, I've got a few people in our group tonight about who we are today. 
with the 9-11 uh, thing. Right now, I see the 9-11 conspiracy, conspiracy as being a total farce. And when you think about it, it's the pinnacle of all of the things that we're dealing with. If we can get a certain percentage of people over the, over the hump in terms of understanding and just opening up, not the emotions, just the facts about how much of the 9-11 Commission report was a farce, and the entire story was a farce. It's almost like a, a surreal situation that we're into when you start realizing how deep this is. And if we can get everybody to actually, if you're not aware of it now, we've got many DVDs here, we get a lot of information. I just need to have you go to YouTube and try to figure out what it is that actually happened. And it will change the world if we can actually get more and more people to understand that this is a total farce. And don't take my word for it, study it. I got the DVDs here as best we can. Patricia? I'd like to respond to the 9-11 conspiracy. Um, I think that one of the best products of work that came out was from Naomi Wolf. When she talks about, you know, Stalin, and she talks about Mussolini creating the blueprint for what happened with 9-11. And, you know, they have done this over and over and over again, where they basically blew up their own buildings, they created mass hysteria, they inundate us every day with terrorism, terrorists, terrorize. You know, you fucking terrorize me with saying terrorism every day. I mean, it's like I'm so sick of it. It is like I'm so the basic pinnacle of our issue. It right. truly is. If we can take the top down and start realizing the true truth of what the hell went on, we will start saying everything else will crumble. And that's what we need. We need a, we need a crumbling point where this will collapse and something new will come about through actual democratic processes and people being informed and intelligent. Just like the buildings you probably had to... <laughs> Very much. This, the, the basic... The behind that, probably. And the most important thing is stay away from the emotions. Tell everybody to stay away from the emotions. Who did it? Whatever it's all about. Just stay with the technical facts, what we see, and what is available very blatantly in front of our eyeballs as to what this means. That's how powerful this is. I think that one of the one of the YouTube videos that I think would be really helpful, in addition to what you're saying, is uh, Naomi Wolf has a YouTube video, and it's called The Ending of Democracy, and she goes through 10 points of what happens and what has happened in each country over the course of time since Mussolini had created this blueprint for the ending of democracy, and I think it would be well worth your time to watch the video because it really lays out what happens to these tyrannists and how they execute a plan of action to galvanize nationalism behind a false flag. And so, you know, I think it's really worth everyone's time. I'm going to post it all over on Facebook, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but, by the way, you guys, I'm, I'm going to interject here very quickly, because um, this conversation is actually a perfect example of what we're trying to do here. Because you know what? Here's the thing. People who believe in, in the 9-11 quote-unquote conspiracy theories, of which I am one, we should absolutely be allowed to have a voice. We should be allowed to speak. And right along with that, people who don't believe that 9-11 was an inside job and their perspectives should be allowed to speak and should be allowed to, to have their views put forward and listen to each other with an honest and respectful conversation. So having said that, who's hungry? Yeah. 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 Is that a hand for a yet hungry or, or for the or for the mic? Let's eat, guys. It's all back there. Pizzas are coming right now. Rub it up, Doug. Thanks for the grub. Don't just thank for the grub. So uh, we're supposed to be back in like 25 minutes, and I'll leave the video on, or I will stop it and cycle it so that we. Uh, Save uh, the morning session and then I'll just leave the camera running.